So we have our arc length formula. We were just looking at that asteroid. So let's go ahead and do the perimeter of that same asteroid we had up there. So we already have the T values for one full lap. And can we exploit symmetry now if we want perimeter? Yes, we can. We can actually go even further. Not only could we quadruple the first, we could multiply it by eight if we wanted to go to the halfway point, but I said let's just do the first quadrant and then quadruple it so it's similar. Because then we'll be using nice pi over two instead of pi over four. It's always nicer to use the easier trig values. Rewrite our asteroid coordinates, x, y, cosine first, cos cubed t, sine cubed t. And we already got the t value, so I'm just writing them in here. So t is going to go 0 to 2 pi. And I'll do a really fast sketch. We're going to quadruple the first quadrant. And that was 0 to pi over 2. So all you do is basically take the derivative of the x function, that'll be the f prime derivative of the y function g prime, square those derivatives. We're going to simplify it and then find the antiderivative. So take those two derivatives separately, simplify it, and then find the antiderivative. So I'll give you a minute head start. We'll see who gets the perimeter first. Good time to ask any questions if you're stuck. That's like, here's the x function derivative. And then when you're done with the derivative, you have to square that derivative. So you're going to have a chain rule happening on your, each of your derivatives. And then you're going to be squaring those derivatives. So there's going to be a little algebra simplification before you actually integrate. And co squared plus sine squared is still 1. So don't forget about that. Should, there should be a lot of cancellation.
Oh yeah, definitely with Piper too. That's, yeah, we're going, so I'm not going to two pi, I'm going to pi over two. So we got a quadruple. I just didn't write it. No, I'm kidding. Uh, which, hopefully I did my algebra right. So I'm showing less algebra steps as we go further in calculus class. So questions on getting to this step here. So you're just basically doubling all your powers. That's all you're doing when you're squaring here. Uh, from here, there's a cos squared, cos squared, and a sine squared. So basically everybody's got a cos squared, sine squared right there. So I factored those out. That's what you see right here. And what's left over is a cos, there's an extra cos squared and an extra sine squared is what's left over. And I factored the three squared all the way outside as square root three squared. So that's why that three squared turned into a three. Because whenever it escapes the square root, it always gets square rooted. So does that answer mm -hmm. your question? And then what did I do? So on the next step, there's two things I did. One of them is cos squared plus sine squared cancels to 1. So you could just put a line through it if you want to. It cancels to 1. We're multiplying, so it disappears. If we're adding, it would have to be a plus 1. But we're multiplying, so it just cancels out. Cos squared, sine squared, the reason I put absolute value around it because if cosine was negative or sine was negative, if I'm going to square them and square root, that negative would get turned to a positive. So that's why I kept that absolute value right there. That comes from the algebra property. You have just any variable squared, square rooted, that turns into absolute value like that. That's all I'm doing. Now on the next line here, I'm just going to erase the absolute values. Uh, what's that? So it's a square root of terms that are squared. So they're canceling out, but it cancels out as the absolute value. Because if you square the negatives, they turn positive, and then you're square rooting them after. So numerically, they cancel out, but the negative part would be lost. For a different reason, why can I throw out absolute value? That's a little more technical. Why are they positive? They're not always positive, but why are they in this situation? Are they positive? We're in quadrant one, so everybody's positive in quadrant one. Only because we're in quadrant one. If I was not in quadrant one, this would be way more annoying. How did I show you way back? This will come up again, I'm sure, at some point here. 
So if the absolute value didn't cancel, how did we do absolute value before in Calc 1 and Calc 2? We did, I think we called it total area or absolute value of area between the x-axis and the function. What did we do to absolute value functions to get the absolute value out? We made a plus and minus. So we turned it into a step function. So it was either going to be regular f or negative f. And that just depended on if it was positive or negative. So it's regular f when f of x is greater than or equal to 0. Negative f when f of x was less than 0. And when you went to uh, find the integral, so for example, if we just do something easy like 0 to 2 pi integral absolute value cos x dx, so this would be total area of cosine of one period. Now the absolute value is very different. If I took the absolute value away, let's look at what cosine actually looks like. Here's the graph of one period of cosine. The areas would cancel if I don't go absolute value. I'll get zero. But now looking at it, you could use symmetry to do this. You could just quadruple the first positive area. That would be the same as or quadruple that will give us the total area. But the way to properly do this, we have pi over 2 and then 3 pi over 2. That's where it goes from positive to negative and back to positive again. So I would go 0 to pi over 2. Cos x dx plus integral pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. Now because it would be negative here, I have to un make it unnegative or back to positive. So it's negative cos x dx. So that's we're flipping it to positive right there. And then 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi. Cos x dx. So that's how we would deal with absolute value. I'm glad I didn't have to do that here because I'd have to think even more carefully because not only do we have absolute value of cosine, we have absolute value of cosine times sine. So I gotta think when is that product positive, when is that product negative? So that would require a little more brain cells than just the cosine function. But that's how I would deal with total area under the cosine graph of one period. So again, we didn't have to worry about that here, but that definitely can come up other times. So just remember, if you have absolute value, turn into a step function. How do we integrate cos times sine? U sub. U sub, when in doubt, Go for u sub first. If you can't just think of the antiderivative off the top of your head, think about a u sub. I'm going to let u equal sine, so then my du is positive. But it doesn't matter which way you go. It will just be one less negative sine. Let u equal sine t. du equals cos t dt. So this is integral u du. When I do u substitution on definite integrals, what I do is leave the starting and ending values blank. And then I put them back in when I get back into, I unsubstitute back to t's and then put the t values back in. The other option is you can convert your t values into u values and then you don't have to substitute back. So I always do it this way instead. So I'm just putting these little scribbles in because I don't want to spend the time computing these. I'll just convert back. So we have 12, or really 6 u squared. It's u squared over 2, which will reduce our 12 to the 6. And again, I'm not going to fill in the values until the next step. So that would be 6 sine squared from 0 to pi over 2. So 
We have sine squared pi over two minus sine squared of zero. Sine squared of zero is zero. So sine squared pi over two is one. So the perimeter is six. That seems kind of strange. I was expecting, naively expecting to see a pi somewhere in there. But again, we didn't find that perimeter of a circle. It was kind of distorted. So I'm gonna go back up to what we were looking at before, that uh, larger asteroid I drew. And let's think about the perimeter. I think I erased when I turned it into a circle, so I'll re-turn it into a circle. So I think, at least to my eyes, the perimeters look somewhat similar. I don't think there's any reason to believe they would be the same, but at least pretty close. What, was the, what would be the perimeter of the actual circle I just drew? What's a diameter? Diameter's two and you multiply by pi, so two pi would be the circumference of the circle. How close is that to six? Almost 6 .2. It's like 6.28 something something, so pretty close. So that is one way you can use your intuition. Oh, I know that it should be pretty close to that value. The area is obviously significantly different, so think about the two areas, that's, uh, they're pretty far off, but the perimeter seem like it should be similar, and just comparing it to two pi is pretty close. What do we do after after we got the uh, arc length? What do we do in calculus two class? Surface area. Surface area. <laughs> the next <laughs> thing on the cheat sheet. <laughs> so we're gonna look at surface area. And to do surface area, we're going to take a curve and then rotate it. So surface area of a parametric curve defined by, we use the same F function for x and the same g function for y. Rotate it about the x-axis. Now this assumes y is greater than or equal to zero. Our surface area s will be the integral t0 to t1. So it's going to be 2 pi y times derivative of x squared plus derivative of y. These are the t derivatives, so these are dot notation dt. So this is rotate about the x axis, and then if we rotate about the y axis, positive x-coordinate. So our surface area is the integral t0 to t1, 2 pi x, square root x dot squared plus y dot squared dt. What happens if we're not rotating about the x-axis? So let's just do a real quick, we won't compute this one out, but if I want to take this curve and 
rotate it. Let's get crazy and rotate it about this line way up here. We'll say that's y equals six. If we think of the arc length part of this, that's gonna stay the same. But what does change here? It's probably on your cheat sheet too. What changes? So our arc length will be the same. That's independent of where, vertically of where I rotate, whether it's x axis or a horizontal line or above or below. But what's gonna change is when we do our rotation, if I draw where this piece rotates into, it'll change the uh, radius or the diameter of that rotated surface piece. So what corresponds to that is this height right here. So that's what would change. So when rotated about a line y equals a, instead of y equals zero, you're going to use two pi absolute value y minus a. Now the reason I put absolute value is because if, uh, in our example right here, if I did our current y value minus six, would I get positive or negative? Look at where the y value is compared to six. Is the y value of the curve ever above six? Nope, so I get negative for all those. So that's why I put absolute value. You wanna make sure your radius is positive. You're measuring the radius, the distance to that rotation axis. So in this case, the distance would be the absolute value of six minus, or y minus six. You can do big minus small, that works just as well, yeah. Big minus small is very universal. That works also. So we did a lot of big minus smalls, so that works just as well. So if we are rotating about a vertical line, what's gonna change is the same, uh, what's playing the same role, that's counting how big the radius is, which will be the x in this case. So if we rotate about the line x equals b, that will turn into two pi absolute value x minus b or again, you can go with uh, big minus small. Now in this case, big is gonna be on the left or right and small will be on the right or left. Is big further to the right or further to the left? It'll be further to the right. So it's gonna be thing that's bigger or further to the right minus thing that's further to the left, because you have to kind of turn your head sideways and just think about where are big x values and where are small x values. Big x values are always to the right. All right, we're gonna do the surface area of the asteroid now, rotated about the x-axis. And these are important, put boxes around them.
Now when I rotate the asteroid, is it enough to just rotate the top of the asteroid? Will that generate the entire uh, shape that I need? Yes, it will. If you rotate both parts, you'll double count the surface area and you'll get twice what you are looking for. So just think about rotations is sort of one slice and you're gonna rotate it 360 degrees. So you're gonna get, pick up the entire surface with this right here. And all we need to do is basically redoing the last problem. The only difference is you're going to put in a two pi x. So we already reduced and computed that square root. I think it turned into three cos theta sine theta, absolute value. Oh, let's use symmetry. Do I even need to do the whole top half of the asteroid? I can use the right half. If I can erase, there we go. I'll use the right half. Now do I quadruple or double this rotation? Double. You're gonna double it. So it's a little bit strange, you're gonna double this rotation. So T zero to pi over two and we're doubling. You can use the reduced square root part, but we have that extra, it's not just times two pi, it's times two pi x. So your antiderivative will be different. You can copy that square root, what that square root turns into, but it's not two pi times the last answer. It's two pi x antiderivative. Skipping as many steps as I can, pretty much here. Oh yes, we get another the two for doubling. And for the same reason before, our absolute value can disappear because we're going zero to pi over two. don't have to think harder than a U-sub for this one. A single U-sub will solve this for you.
any questions on that work? So that's the end of 11.2. So I could give you 11.2 quiz Monday, but I'm most likely going to give you, well, I'm definitely going to give you a quiz tomorrow because it's Friday. So it won't include 11.2, but definitely will include up through 11.1. So we're about to get into the next section. Hopefully you remember polar coordinates from pre-calculus 2 class. That is where we're picking up with the coordinates. Polar coordinates, normally we use rectangular coordinates. So we have an X and a Y. Of course, polar coordinates are measured with a theta and an R for the radius. So there are three equations we're going to need here. There's a fourth equation also, but write down as many equations to relate X and Y to R and theta as you can. I'll give you a hint, one has cosine, one of them has sine. Another equation has no trig in it at all. So see if you can write down some or all of the equations to represent x and y to r and theta. So the Pythagorean theorem should have been maybe one of the more obvious ones. So we have x squared plus y squared equals r squared. It's from our right triangle right there. Now cosine of theta is adjacent, which will be the x side over the hypotenuse, which is the r side. So I wrote that cosine equals x over r. And I, what I want to do is get all the uh, polar on one side and rectangular on the other. So in this form, it's correct, but I have rectangular and polar on the right side. So I'm going to get the R out by multiplying by R. So I'll write this as X equals R cos theta. Now the sine relationship is very similar. It just uses Y over R. So multiply by R. And we have y equals r sine theta. There's a third equation. We won't use it so much. Or a fourth equation. Do you remember the fourth equation? It uses the tangent function. And we don't have a radius in the tangent function. Tangent is opposite, which is y over adjacent, which is x. So really the first three are the main ones you're going to need. You probably have these memorized or very close to being memorized. So you can put them on your cheat sheet. So let's start out with just a coordinates question. Find all polar coordinates. Four, two, negative pi over three, and this is in already in polar. So we have an R 
and a theta. Now, why did I say all polar coordinates? What could I do to the angle and still be describing the same coordinate? Add 2 pi. So I can add 2 pi. I could add 2 pi, or I could add 2 pi and 2 pi and 2 pi as many times as I want. I can take away 2 pi, rotate backwards the rotation, take away as many 2 pi as I want. So yeah, we'll be using 2 pi n. So with the radius of 2, our angle will be negative pi over 3 plus 2 pi n. And this works for any integer n. So I'll write for any n in z. What else can I do? I think that's the only way to modify the angle and get the same point although that's infinite other points, what could I do to the radius? If I make the radius zero, I'm not talking about the same point because that would be the origin. Make a negative and add a pi. Make a negative and then do a half rotation to compensate. So negative will jump to the other side of the circle or the opposite side of the origin and then we'll make it negative or add a half rotation to bring it back. So that's how we're going to write the other coordinates. Ooh. negative 2. Now it's negative pi over 3 plus pi. We want to add as many rotations or as many full rotations. So there we go and this is any n in z. So let's start out with some easy polar equations and graphs. Before we converted these, I want for what we're doing right now to just graph in polar. So don't worry about, in fact, don't convert to rectangular. Just graph in the polar coordinates that I'm going to write down. So how do we know this is an equation and not a point? I could have an equation with the theta in it. So it's an equation because there's an equal sign. How do I know specifically it's not a point? It's just a single uh, expression on each side. It's not wrapped up in parentheses. So equations, when we graph equations, they should all be curves. Well, until we go up to higher dimensions. But for now, they're all just curves. All right, radius of 3. The best way to think about that, just think about what a radius 3 looks like, and there's no angle specified, so theta can be anything. Not just 0 to 2 pi, but any amount whatsoever. So that's going to trace out a circle of radius 3. So there's our graph right there. And our next example. Theta equals 2 pi over 3. So 2 pi over 3 is going to be right here in quadrant 2. And on this example, theta is uh, specified, so we know what angle to look at, but we don't know the radius, so radius could be anything. So if the radius is zero, we have the origin. If radius is positive, it can be any positive value, so it's gonna go up in that direction. And if radius is negative, it's going to go negative up in that direction, also known as down to the right. So here we got a line, and the angle is just specifying the slope of the line. Now we're going to graph inequalities. So first we'll do 1 less than equal to r less than equal to 2. So r is allowed to equal 1 and allowed to equal 2. 
So it's going to look a lot like those, the r equals 3. We're just going to get a circle with radius 1 and a second circle with radius 2. So let's graph those out first. So there's a radius 1 circle and a radius 2 circle. What else do I get on the graph from the inequalities? Shading. So what part or parts am I shading? Everything between 1 and 2. So between the w circle 1, radius 1, and between the circle radius 2. So that gets all shaded in. Second inequality, pi over 4 less than or equal to theta, less than or equal to 3 pi over 4. So theta equals pi over 4 gives us the line with the slope measured pi over 4. And now 3 pi over 4 is halfway into quadrant two. And we get all the thetas in between. Now we have to be careful. Why would it be wrong if I counted everything over here on the right side? So theta is supposed to be between pi over four and three pi over four. So we're really counting on the positive side so the right side to shade, or the correct side to shade, is the top part right there. So it's between those two. There is no restriction on R, so any point up here, if it had a negative radius, would be down in that bottom triangle down there as well. So we're also getting the negative part right there. And the last thing we're going to do is combine these inequalities together. We're going to intersect the graphs. And when we intersect the graphs, and draw them all out on top of each other. Now when I shade, I'm going to be extra careful here. So I'm going to get two pieces of pizza crust. Like that right there. So it's what's in common to both. Any last questions 